In an egg lock, the first Pokemon you find per route has to be replaced with an egg from a viewer that could be anything they choose. It's also a Nuzlocke, where any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever. So, very much at the mercy of you guys, I set off on stream to trade my starter for my very first egg, which after a bit of running around in Mesa Goza, pleasantly hatches into a Charmander. A great start, but we've also got a Tarantula from Poco Path to trade for an egg that hatches into Larvesta, and Volcarona is an immensely powerful Pokemon, but it evolves at level 59 at the very end of the game. So right now, this thing's basically just making my life harder by hogging a spot on the team. Luckily though, both of our Pokemon are fire types, so we have no problem scorching Katie's bug types to claim our first gym badge. While I'm around Cortando, I pick up a Squovet that we trade away for our next egg, which hatches into a Spiritomb, and how does this thing even lay eggs? There's so many unanswered questions. Like, why does Spiritomb walk as if it's a city pigeon, when clearly it could just helicopter away? Regardless, Spiritomb's gonna be a great backup plan to have, since our next opponent, Brassius, seems super easy with his grass types, but his sturdy Sudowoodo with a hundred base attack rock stab is definitely a problem. Before I even reach Brassius, however, I find a couple of new encounters to trade for eggs that hatch into a Fomantis and a Char Cadet. The big problem facing Brassius is that he'll always survive a flamethrower on one HP with Sturdy and be able to take us out with a rock throw. So to combat that, our newly evolved Charmeleon sets up a substitute versus Petalil, which is never going to be able to break it with Mega Drain or Sleep Powder. We outspeed both Petalil and Smoliv and can easily overkill them with Stab Terra Boosted Flamethrowers. This just leaves Pseudo Wudo, and if Brassius attempts to try and break our sub with a Trailblaze to also boost his speed, Charmeleon is actually just faster even after the boost. This way, the substitute guarantees our victory. But the RNG gods decide to bless us with even swifter victory since our flamethrower gets a burn, getting us our second gym badge one turn faster than expected. From there, I pick up another egg to fill out my team of six, which hatches into a Dreepy. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this is awesome just because Dreepy is a pseudo-legendary, but that's not really the case. Just like Larvesta, Dreepy evolves at a ridiculously high level, however, Dreepy's also stuck with a worthless moveset and some of the worst stats in the game. So it would be great if we could just keep this guy as an awesome backup in the box, but the way the rules work, once we have a full team, we don't actually get to hatch more eggs until one of our Pokemon faints. And since even Fomantis evolved at level 37, half of our team is pretty much just dead weight. Another rule my chat put in place is I don't get to just let a Pokemon faint for no reason, so we're gonna have to work with what we've got. Luckily, Spiritomb is completely busted, since it's immune to every single move that Cloth has. It can't be blocked because of its ghost typing, which is also immune to normal and fighting type moves. And since Cloth only has Rock Smash and Vice Grip, it doesn't stand a ghost of a chance. With the first Titan defeated, I go and catch a Bronzor to trade for more eggs, but this actually fills a second function. You see, by defeating a bunch of Bronzors, we can pick up Bronzor Fragments. And once we've collected 10, we can visit this man in Zapapico that gives us the auspicious armor, which in turn we can use for a much needed team upgrade by evolving Char Cadet into Armor Rouge, which leads us into the second Titan fight versus Bombardier. And with Will-O-Wisp on my super tanky Spiritomb, there's no way that this fight was going to be difficult at all, so my chat decided to invoke a terrifying rule. If I manage to defeat one of the remaining six gym leaders without losing a Pokemon, chat gets to vote one of my fully evolved Pokemon off the team. This was a terrible idea. What was I thinking? Luckily, before we face any more gym leaders, we have to take on Giacomo of Team Star. And while Armor Rouge is weak to dark, we can easily get rid of that weakness by terrestrializing into fire. Then we can take out his Ponyard with a super effective Mystical Fire, leaving him with the real problem, his Starmobile. However, because we're not weak to dark anymore, Wicked Torque doesn't do too much damage, and we can almost KO it with a few Mystical Fires. This does, however, leave Armor Rouge in the red, so I'm forced to swap out into Spiritomb, who can easily deal with the remaining health of the Starmobile with a Nightshade. Oh boy, it's gym leader time. As we enter this gym fight, there's officially no chance we're getting out of it without losing a Pokemon, be it by Iono's hand or yours. So I terrestrialize Armor Rouge and instantly take out a lead Watrol with a Terra boosted Mystical Fire. Against her Belly Bolt, we do run into super effective Water Gun, so I've made sure to run an Assault Vest on Armor Rouge to get more special defense and lower its special attack with a Mystical Fire, so it basically does nothing. Another Mystical Fire takes care of the Belly Bolt, sending in her Luxio. Because Armor Rouge is a special attacker, Intimidate doesn't affect us negatively, instead it actually has a positive effect. Because Armor Rouge is holding an Assault Vest, we can't equip it with a Person Berry or something to dodge confusion from Miss Magus. So having our attack lowered by Intimidate just makes it so that we'll take less damage if we hit ourselves. 
which knowing my luck is exactly what happens the very first turn. Miss Magus then hits a hex, powered up by the fact that I'm status, however it doesn't even do that much because of my assault vest and the fact that we got rid of my psychic type. Adding a mystical fire to that to lower Miss Magus' special attack is gonna make it do even less the next turn. From there, instead of going for another mystical fire, I attempt to go for a Psy Shock, which I do manage to connect with, and because of Miss Magus' terrible physical defense, we can take it out and claim the third gym badge. And so, because I'd spectacularly dominated the third gym, the lives of my Pokemon now lay in your hands. You may now vote. Who are we gonna be voting off the team? Ladies and gentlemen, the results are in. Spiritomb was a loyal Pokemon. It's a rock with 108 spirits in it. But it was my rock, and it got me through some tough times, but it's gonna have to go all the way in the fainted box. I was devastated. You guys have just zapped my Spiritomb into the afterlife, if it wasn't already there. In need of a new team member, I ran around to hatch an egg and got myself a brand spanking new Ryolu. So we immediately started washing it to boost its friendship, and I accidentally got some on Charmeleon. He really didn't like that. But Ryolu certainly did, since it very shortly thereafter evolved into Lucario. This thing could be a great asset to our team, since it's got a fantastic matchup versus both Orthworm and Ooh. Atticus. We just have to do our best to keep it around. Once I defeated Orthworm, it was time to take on Mela, but uh, she didn't really seem to understand how flash fire works, so it was pretty easy for Armor Rouge to just pick up the victory for free. Meaning that our next real opponent is Kofu, and because he's a gym leader, we're gonna be losing a Pokemon after this fight, no matter what happens. Now, even though Lucario doesn't have an obviously great matchup versus Belooza, there's nothing really else I can lead with since my Pokemon are either really, really weak or fire types. So after setting up a Calm Mind to boost my special attack, I'm gonna have to rely on Lucario to deal with this. Since Belooza's a psychic type, we can one-shot it with a Dark Pulse, however, one Trio comes in next and is faster, and very fortunately doesn't get a confusion with the Water Pulse, allowing us to take it out with a single Aura Sphere. Once Crabomitable comes in, I Terrastalize to give myself as much power as I possibly can with my Aura Sphere, which is not enough to take out the Crabomitable in one hit. Please, Kofu, we can talk about this. Don't do it. No! <laughs> It's a tough blow for the team, but I really couldn't risk setting up any more against Veluza without risking being KO'd by Itterwug Trio. At least after the Rocky Helmet damage, Dreepy can do the first useful thing of its life and take out Crabominable with a quick attack. Losing Lucario means that Atticus certainly isn't free anymore, but at least you guys didn't get to vote anything else off the team. So it's off to the races again, hatching another egg, this time into Murkrow. And because there's a Duskstone you can find right behind the Montanavera gym, we can immediately evolve it into Honchcrow. And what follows is a disaster. Atticus of Team Star would have been a complete and utter sweep if we just had Lucario, but instead we have to resort to Plan B. And Plan B, of course, immediately backfired. You see, my hope was that Skuntank would go for Sucker Punch, seeing that it's super effective against Armor Rouge, but instead it just goes for Toxic, which was always a risk. I do at least have a Petra Berry to get rid of Poison, and I can set up a Calm Mind to get plus one special attack and special defense. But Skuntank really doesn't want to play ball and just poisons me again the next turn. And this time, we can't get rid of that poison with a Petra Berry, so it's gonna be here to stay, but at least we can get up another Calm Mind to get to plus two. After that, I Terrastalize just in case it wants to go for a Sucker Punch, but it ends up going for a Venishock instead, which doesn't do too much despite being poisoned since we're at plus two special defense. I next fire off a Flame Charge. This is to boost our speed so that we can outspeed the next turn with a Mystical Fire, taking out the Skun Tank. And our newfound haste is gonna be completely necessary in order to outspeed the Reviroom and take it out with a Mystical fire. So far so good, but as Atticus sends in Muck, Armor Rouge is starting to get pretty low on health, and if we take this Muck out, we're gonna go down to poison. Or at least, that's what you might think. However, in these team star fights, whenever you knock out the second to last Pokemon, the Starmobile comes out no matter what, without any end of turn effects. In fact, even if you're not choosing to play on set mode, you don't even get the option to swap Pokemon. And while that means Armor Rouge doesn't fall to poison, we're still in big trouble. Armor Rouge is also the only only Pokemon we have that can deal super effective damage, so we are forced to make a sacrifice here, and even though we get to switch something in for free now, we are not faster than the Starmobile with any of our Pokemon, so things are looking very grim. With the morbid realization that everything is most likely lost, I start shuffling through my Pokemon and realize that Nightstar actually has String Shot. Getting the Starmobile to minus two would allow Armor Rouge and Charmeleon to outspeed, but Honchko would be out of luck. I'm gonna have to take the shot without even knowing if Larvesta can even take a Noxious Torque, which it ends up doing. So I managed to fire off my String Shot, lowering the Starmobile's speed by two, which of course means that Larvesta is gonna have to bite the dust. 
with four Pokemon remaining, all of which being one or more speed brackets below this thing, I was desperately scrambling to try and find any means whatsoever to try and deal some damage. So I send in Dreepy and wait a minute. It seems to me like the Starmobile doesn't see a KO with any of its moves going for spin out, which actually harshly lowers its speed, setting it at minus four. I then follow up with my idiotic strategy of infestation, which of course isn't gonna damage the Starmobile over time because it's immune to status effects. My next mistake is going for the one HP of damage by using Quick Attack, which activates toxic debris, so now all my Pokemon are gonna be poisoned. On top of that, Revivroom goes for Flame Charge, boosting its speed one stage, and even though at minus three, we can still outspeed with all of our Pokemon. Things are very quickly falling back apart, but we still have three Pokemon, and if I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down trying. And while there's no way for Armourouge to get out of this alive, at least it outspeeds when the Starmobile is at minus three, and we can get a hefty chunk of damage before it goes down to a Noxious Torque. Which means that we're down to our final two Pokemon. Honchkrow being a flying type, it at least doesn't take any damage from Toxic Spikes, and I can start firing off Acrobatics, which does about 15%. After that, the Starmobile goes for a flame charge, boosting its speed further, which means that Honchkrow can no longer outspeed. And Noxious Torque is a non-negotiable two-shot. So once another Acrobatics gets the Starmobile into the red, I use a Sucker Punch with priority, which just barely falls short of taking it out. This leaves us with only one Pokemon, but it is one of the two that can outspeed the Starmobile at minus two, meaning that from the very edge of defeat, I somehow managed to pull off this win with only one Pokemon remaining. Oh, my poor team. My poor team. The one saving grace of this being that now we get to hatch a whole lot of eggs. First off, getting us a Dunsparce, my favorite Pokemon, followed up by Satitan, Scyther, Dondozo, and Choodle. And once I pick up an Ice Stone in Dolly's Zappa Passage, we can actually evolve most of our Pokemon into their final forms, meaning that we're now a lot better equipped than we ever were for what's to come. And come to think of it, being very well prepared is not always a great thing. You see, having a defensive steel type like Scizor with access to Swords Dance and Brick Break, Larry is a completely free fight. And because Larry's a gym leader, something's getting voted off the team, and since all of our Pokemon are fully evolved, anything could be under fire. Also, since Twitch polls only allow for five options, I rolled a six-sided die to see what Pokemon would be immune from being voted off. So after rolling a one and protecting Charizard, despite me, you guys decided to vote off the the evolution of my favorite Pokemon. Listen, I'm willing to forgive this injustice. All you gotta do is subscribe to the channel. You keep coming back to these videos anyway, so you might as well be subscribed. With another Pokemon voted off, I of course hatch an egg into Magnemite, a fantastic encounter. It's got some amazing matchups in this game, and on top of that, we can immediately evolve it into Magnezone. And if one Pokemon getting voted off wasn't enough, we have to risk another getting voted off by taking on the sixth gym leader, Rhyme. And this double battle has the gimmick where if you terastalize, you gain a whole bunch of stats at the end of the turn, which we can use a lot better than Rhyme, who starts out by just hitting my Dreadnought with a couple of priority moves as I set up a substitute with Charizard and break the disguise of Mimikyu with a crunch from Dreadnought. You do get additional boosts for taking out Pokemon, but you can only get one special gimmick boost at the end of the turn, so I opt to just terastalize to get my Omni boost for both of my Pokemon. We're now very much in the driver's seat as Banette fails to take out my substitute with a priority Sucker Punch and I can damage the Mimikyu with an Air Slash. Dreadnought can then finish off the Banet with a Crunch, getting ourselves an attack and special attack boost at the end of the turn. Mimikyu does manage to break the sub with a Slash, but we're not gonna be needing it anymore anyway. In comes Houndstone, but because we're now at plus two special attack, Charizard immediately sends it back to the cemetery with a Fire Blast, followed by a crunch from Dreadnought taking out the Mimikyu, leaving Rhyme only with her final Pokemon Toxtricity. But because my stats are now more inflated than a wacky wavy inflatable arm flailing tube man, the fight is decisively over, and because I didn't lose a Pokemon, my fate once again rests in your hands. I did roll a three, protecting Satitan from being voted off, which means that you guys voted off Don Dozo, which I'm pretty bummed about since I've never gotten to use this thing. Either way, we move to Alphornada to take on the next gym, where my next egg hatches into a Komala, a surprisingly interesting Pokemon since it can't be statused. Now at this stage in the game, we have two routes we can go. We can either take on the Great Tusk Titan or the next gym leader, Tulip, which does involve the guarantee of losing a Pokemon. However, we have multiple decent counters to Great Tusk on our team, so I decide to take on Tulip first. And for Tulip's psychic types, we've got Scizor, which is actually the perfect counter, since the Steel-type 
type resists her psychic type moves, and we can deal super effective damage with our bug typing. It really isn't rocket science, but it meant that we were once again gonna be losing a Pokemon of your guys' choice. And much like after Larry, I once again roll a 1, protecting Charizard from being voted off, which started a war on Charizard in the chat. But because Charizard was safe, you guys kicked out Scizor with the reasoning that it had given me way too many free wins so far. So I reached for my next egg, and you guys certainly didn't disappoint with a Quaxley. But not just any Quaxley, this one has its hidden ability Moxie, which is a completely broken ability to give a Pokemon with a speed boosting signature move. Either way, we have a great test to take on, and my strategy was simple. I was going to Terrastalize to get rid of my fighting weakness with Dreadnaw, and then start setting up my defense and dodge any incoming critical hits with Shell Armor. I immediately forget to Terrastalize. This almost costs me my Dreadnaw, leaving it at just 14 HP, allowing me to hit a Chilling Water to lower Great Tusk's attack, but there's no chance we can stay in here, so I'm forced to swap out, sending in Charizard. This backup plan works out exceedingly well since I can resist a Brick Break and just one-shot the rest of the Great Tusk's health with an Air Slash. And for the second phase of the fight, I actually remember to Terrastalize, and my plan works like a charm. Go figure. This means we have one final gym to take on versus Grusha and his Ice types before we can take on the Elite Four. And would I be me if I didn't immediately make a huge mistake? I should have immediately just taken this Frost Moth out. Instead, I go for a substitute after I Terrastalize, thinking that that would let me survive a blizzard, but that just lets Frostmoth set up a tailwind and outspeed the next turn, taking out my substitute anyway with a blizzard. This does allow me to take Frostmoth out with a flamethrower, but the tailwind being up means that his incoming bear tick will outspeed. And since I've gotten rid of my flying type, I am very weak to an earthquake, so I swap into Satitan. And Satitan is a bulky boy, able to shrug off two earthquakes with 100 HP to spare and then lower bear tick's attack with a charm. And while tailwind is now over, we can't exactly do a lot of damage in return with Body Slam, but Earthquake is now doing basically nothing, so after slamming into it enough times, we can take Bear Tick out anyway. Third is Grush's own Satitan, and since we're now at pretty low health in the red, we have to swap out, deciding to swap in Quaquavel. And this Mother Ducker has not come to play. After taking a Liquidation, I can go for a Low Sweep to take out half of Satitan's health as it opts to go for an Ice Spinner. This is Grush's fatal mistake, since I gave Quaquavel a Snowball, boosting its attack when I get hit by an ice type move. This means that once I take out the Satitan's remaining health with a low sweep, my Moxie boost gets me to plus two attack. Way more enough than I need to take out his final Pokemon Altaria in one shot with a super effective low sweep. And since you guys now get to vote off another Pokemon, Charizard gets absolutely obliterated. It's not even close. And so you'd once again left me with no choice but to hatch another egg, this time into Clauncher. Which leads us to what I told you about Magnezone earlier. Before we can take on the Elite Four, we have a couple of Team Star fights to face and the final Titan. But two out of these fights are just free for Magnezone, the first of which being Ortega. The man and his fairy types just aren't prepared for a steel type of this caliber, granting us a very very easy victory, which we can just as easily claim versus Don Dozo, meaning we only have one terrifying fight to face before we can officially challenge the Elite Four. But I came in with a plan, one that could be potentially foiled if Toxic Rogue managed to poison me. But after setting up a bulk up, the first poison jab doesn't get the poison. So I'm completely safe to set up a second bulk up the next turn since no critical hit could take me out. And amazingly, the second poison jab doesn't poison me either, so I get a free third bulk up, and I don't even get poisoned by the third poison jab. At this point, however, we are in crit plus poison range, so I reveal my secret weapon and use rest to put myself to sleep and regain all my health, after which I can wake up by using a chesto berry. It actually wouldn't have been the end of the world if we got poisoned off of this final poison jab, but luckily we don't even have to deal with that and can take out Toxicroak with an Aqua Step, getting us a speed boost and a moxie attack boost before she sends in Passimian. Once again, it's essential we go for Aqua Step here to take it out to further boost our speed so that we'll eventually be able to outspeed the Starmobile. Annihilate is a very bulky Pokemon and could potentially handle an Aqua Step even after all these boots, so I take it out with a full power acrobatic since we've used up our Chesto Berry. Finally, before the Starmobile, she's got Lucario, but it doesn't matter what move we take it out with since we're not going to get a speed boost from Aqua Step at the end of the turn or a Moxie boost because of the way the Starmobile works. And while that's frustrating, we now have more than enough speed and attack to take out the Starmobile 
battle in one hit with a super effective acrobatics. Which means the team we're bringing into the Elite Four consists of Assault Vest Kamala with U-Turn, Trailblaze, Woodhammer, and Body Slam. Choice Scarf, Mega Launcher, Clawitzer with Dragon Pulse, Ice Beam, Water Pulse, and Aura Sphere. Rocky Helmet, Shell Armor, Dreadnought with Rock Polish, Liquidation, Iron Defense, and Body Press. Focus Sash, Moxie Quackaval with Bulk Up, Acrobatics, Close Combat, and Aqua Step. Magnet Pull Magnazone with Flash Cannon, Volt Switch, Magnet Rise, and Thunderbolt. And Slush Rush to Titan with Ice Spinner, Charm, Ice Shard, and Body Slam. With our team ready to go, it's time to take on the first of the Elite Four member, Rika, and her ground types. And facing Wizcash, we've got the perfect opportunity to introduce the power of Komala. Because while a quad effective Trailblaze isn't enough to take the Wizcash out, look how well we tank this stab, critical hit, Earth Power with that Assault Vest, and can take out the Wizcash the next turn boosting our speed to plus two. In comes Camerupt, and with my Assault Vest, I have nothing to fear from this camel. Seeing as a Fire Blast barely does anything, allowing me to retaliate with a second Body Slam to take it out. This means we've already picked up two KOs with Kamala as Rika sends in Dawn Fan, where we can go for a U-turn to break it sturdy and swap out, even getting a critical hit. And since Quackable actually has pretty decent defense, we don't even take half from an Earthquake, after which we can just take out the Dawn Fan with an Aqua Step, effectively granting us a Dragon Dance after the Speed Boost and Moxie. In comes Doug Trio, but we don't fear Sucker Punch at all and just take it out with a single Aqua Step, granting us a second Dragon Dance. And it's here that I make another huge mistake by just not paying attention to a small detail. You see, I clicked Aqua Step, and Rikka's Clawed Sire actually has Water Absorb. But of course she just uses Protect, leaving me completely unpunished after a totally fatal mistake. Letting me swap into Satitan and easily winning the fight with an Ice Spinner. Which means that with a completely undeserved team of six, we take on Poppy of the Elite Four. And because of Crackable's fighting type, we have a great matchup versus her, but I don't actually think we need to use it if we start out with Satitan and lower Caparaja's attack with Charm. The Copper Raja, in turn, only sets up Stealth Rock, so we get off a second charm before it even gets to attack us with a super effective Heavy Slam. And at this point, we've lowered its attack so much that it's barely doing anything, allowing us to freely swap into Dreadnought, and as you know, it's got Shell Armor, which means it can never be hit by critical hits. Which means that no matter what, we're going to be getting more health back from leftovers each turn than this elephant can ever do to us. This gives us near infinite wiggle room to set up a win condition, so I start by raising my defense followed up by setting up Stealth Rocks and maxing out my speed with Rock Polish. This means we'll be faster than every Pokemon on Poppy's team, and we can break the sturdy of Magnezone to easily take it out in one shot, as well as all her other Pokemon. Not being able to get crit is a super overpowered ability in a Nuzlocke that can easily win you fights like this one. This means we next have to worry about the third Elite Four member, Larry, but if we play this right, I don't think we should have to worry about this at all. The man leads with Tropius, quad weak to ice, allowing us to easily easily take it out with an Ice Spinner the very first turn, granting us a Moxie boost that's going to be very important since his second Pokemon will be Staraptor, lowering our attack back to base. Because we don't want to get hit super effectively by a Flying-type move, I Terrastalize to shed my Fighting Typing, and an Ice Spinner is almost enough to take Staraptor out, which it ends up doing itself with the recoil from a Brave Bird. This unfortunately means we don't actually get a Moxie boost at the end of the turn, but fortunately, Larry's next Pokemon is Altaria, quad weak to Ice, meaning that we can collect that Moxie boost and proceed to just take out Oracorio and Flamigo for an easy victory. Now, as you might imagine, a barrage of Ice Spinners would be incredibly effective versus Hassle, but a plus one Ice Spinner isn't actually enough to take out Haxorus in one shot. The reason I was so keen to play around this is that Haxorus is the second Pokemon in his team order, but in reality, I didn't actually have to play around this at all. I do, however, need to Terrastalize to shed my Fighting type and not get hit super effectively by an Air Slash so I can use Aqua Step to boost my speed and follow that up by a bulk up the next turn to boost my attack so I'll have plus two when I take out the Noivern. In reality, however, the bulk up was completely unnecessary, since when I take out this Noivern with an Ice Spinner, Hassel's gonna send out the Pokemon that has a super effective move against me and not actually as Haxorus. This means that both Dragalge with Thunderbolt and Flapple with Seed Bomb would always come in before Haxorus, granting me at least plus three before it comes in. Meaning that extra bulk up was completely unnecessary and the acquisition of the speed boost from Aqua step was the only required boost. With my entire team of six having survived and decimated the Elite Four, aside from a minor mistake on my part, we're not quite out of the Pokemon League woods yet, since we still have to face Champion Gita. 
And she is certainly no pushover. With a diverse team of six, she's got a few Pokemon that do cause some problems for us. So we're gonna need to make a few strategic decisions. The first of which being to give my Assault Vest to Claw Itzer so that we can easily tank a Lumina Crash, after which we can take out the Espathra in one shot with Dark Pulse. This brings in Go Goat, and we don't have any super effective moves to hit it with, but we can at least swap in our perfect counter, Magnezone. Because even after boosting itself with a bulk up, this thing only has resisted moves to hit Magnezone with, and we can take it out for free with a few flash cannons. This baits in Avalug, and unsure if I can take it out with a single flash cannon, which most likely was the case, I go for a Volt Switch for some massive damage to swap out into my Clawitzer, which actually has pretty decent defense, allowing it to tank an Earthquake and take out Avalug with an Aura Sphere. This also perfectly positions us to take on King Gambit with a quad effective Mega Launcher boosted Aura Sphere, of course taking it out in one shot. Gita then sends in Veluza, which is a very weird Pokemon for the devs to give her since we've already faced it versus Kofu, but at least we can one-shot it with a Mega Launcher boosted Dark Pulse. Leaving Gita with only one final Pokemon, her ace, Glamora. And I really didn't want to risk anything swapping into an Earth Power here, so unfortunately, I have to let Clawitzer go. It's not ideal, but Clawitzer had played its part taking out most of Gita's team, allowing me to send in Dreadnought and Terrastalize to not be hit super Super effectively by an Earth Power, while simultaneously boosting up my water type moves to allow me to take out Glamora in one single liquidation, winning us the Elite Four. All things considered, I'm perfectly happy with those results, but there are still plenty more difficult fights in this game, so we're gonna need to hatch a new Pokemon, this time a Sandile. And having a second Pokemon with Moxie is gonna be incredibly useful, particularly since the ground type has a great matchup versus one of our next fights. We now have to take on the final boss fights for each of the three storylines in the game, and I decide to take on Arvin first. I do this because I figure I have the most obvious matchup, since Quackable is already a great option to take on Arvin if it's your starter, but with Moxie, it begins to get ridiculous. I begin by taking out Greedent with an Aqua Step to boost my speed, since the only Pokemon I'm slower than on his team is the one that's the biggest threat, which is of course his Toad's Cruel, but now that we're faster than it from Aqua Step and we've got plus one from Moxie, a quad effective ice spinner is incredibly effective to take it out. And from there, a combination of acrobatics and close combat is super effective against all his remaining Pokemon, meaning he never stood a chance, especially after all those Moxie boosts. And while this does tie up the Path of Legends storyline, Quackable almost over levels, so I'm gonna have to box it to not risk it growing to level 68. This is gonna make things a lot more difficult when we take on Clavel, since we've just boxed the best possible counter for his Houndoom. Another quirk about this fight is as long as we can get Kamala in versus Poltegeist, we've effectively won the battle, so everything we do needs to lead to that outcome. But first we have to deal with whatever other threats this man sends our way before he sends in his Poltegeist, starting with his lead Oren Guru. We should fall just shy of one-shotting this thing with a crunch from Crocodile, so I equip it with a Life Orb to guarantee we take it out in one hit. This also grants us a Moxie boost, which won't be too useful since Clavel's next Pokemon is Abomasnow, which will with the new snow mechanic would survive a quad effective plus one fire fang, so I'm forced to swap out. And I decided to take advantage of the snowscape myself by sending in Satitan that also gets the boosted defenses. I then use Charm to lower Obama Snow's attack, but the real strategy here is to try and max out our special defense with Amnesia. This way, once the Houndoom comes in, we're gonna be able to one-shot it with a liquidation without fearing being taken out by a fire blast. And so, once I've maximized my special defense, I use a couple of ice spinners to knock knock out the Obama Snow, which means we're now perfectly equipped to take on the incoming Houndoom. So this Houndoom is gonna hit us with a Fire Blast. If this crits, um, ah. Uh, I was gonna say, if this crits, we're in for a bit of trouble. Um, yeah, so that's very bad. So my plan didn't exactly work out, so we're gonna have to settle for the second best option to get a safe switch into Crocodile and just one-shot the Houndoom with an Earthquake, which unfortunately, of course, requires the sacrifice of Satitan. We're not even in the clear yet, though, since Clavel's next Pokemon is Amoongus, so we definitely have to swap out of Crocodile. I decided to first send in Magnezone to resist the Giga Drain, but even better, we just dodge the Toxic with immunity and can then set up a light screen before we get hexed. From here, Magnezone can barely 
barely touch this Amoongus, and it can be put to sleep by Spore, so I decide to swap out into Kamala, which because of its comatose ability counts as a sleep, so it cannot be statused. This means we can't get hit by Toxic or Spore or Hex because we're a normal type, leaving Amoongus with only one option in Giga Drain, and because of that life screen and our pretty decent special defense, the Amoongus stands no chance, forcing Clavel to send in Poltegeist, which is checkmate. The reason this is fatal for Clavel is because he can technically hit me with Sucker Punch, but I can just stall him out of it by going for moves like Bulk Up to boost my stats, easily just stalling out his measly 5 PP. And if he decides to boost his own stats with something like Shell Smash, he can't even hit me with Shadow Ball or status me with Will-O-Wisp. Meaning that once we've stalled him out of Sucker Punches and set up our stats enough to where we feel comfortable, all we have to do is take the Poltegeist out with a Trailblaze, which has the added benefit of boosting our speed, now making us faster than Quackable and allowing us to take it out with a single plus six stab body slam. However, because we lost to Titan, we do have to hatch another egg, this time hatching into Water Tauros. A monstrously powerful addition to the team, especially with that Intimidate ability, giving us way more options. Remember how I told you that ground types have a particularly good matchup versus one of the endgame fights in this game? Well, that happens to be versus Nimona, especially if you've got a ground type that can also boost its speed somehow, which Crocodile unfortunately can't do, so we're gonna have to settle for boosting our attack and defense with Bulk Up. This is a surprisingly reliable strategy. Lycanroc loves to set up Stealth Rocks, giving us a free second Bulk Up, and after that, Drill Runs are just doing nothing. Meaning that once we've set up to plus six attack and defense, we can get rid of this Lycanroc. Palmot comes in second, and if it gets a critical hit with close combat, it could be a huge problem. So I start by going for Protect, just to get myself a little bit of leftovers. After which close combat fails to get a critical hit, allowing me the chance to one-shot the Palmot with a plus six Earthquake. Gudra is third, but it's a special wall and doesn't have the greatest special bulk, especially against plus six stab earthquakes. Orthworm has Earth Eater, so I made sure to give Crocodile Brick Break before the fight so that we can easily knock it out in one super effective hit, which also goes for to Dunsparce. Leaving Nimona with Meow Scarada, the only Pokemon that Crocodile stands zero chance against with a 100% critical hit flower trick, we've got to swap out of there. And what better to go into than our dedicated Meow Scarada counter Magnezone? She just doesn't have any good moves to hit Magnezone with, only doing about 25% with Flower Trick, allowing us to easily get the two-shot with Flash Cannon. Meaning that now that we've completed the Victory Road storyline, we can head to Area... Now, okay, yes, we need to stomp Penny first, but then we can head to Area Zero. We'd lost 13 of our companions along the way. No thanks to you guys. And now only one opponent stands in the way of complete victory. That's right, we've got to take on the final boss of the game, AI Sada. And it's all up to whether or not the Pokemon that you guys sent me are enough to do the job. And because I want an item on Quaquabble, it's actually better damage to go for an Aerial Ace than Acrobatics to take out the Slitherwing. Sada then reveals her most exploitable weakness, and I wasn't about to pull any punches. I first swapped a Magnezone to resist the Play Rough, and then pivot out immediately into Tauros to get off an Intimidate. Because for some reason, this Screamtail only has physical moves. I don't know why the developers did this. It's got a better special attack stat, and its physical attack stat is like in the 60s. It's incredibly bad, giving us the perfect opportunity to continue sending in Tauros time after time to lower its attack further and further until eventually it's at minus six. From there, it's time to execute the plan, sending in Quackable, which aside from Aerial Ace, doesn't actually have any attacking moves. Instead, our mission is to set up six bulk ups to boost our attack and defense, and three agilities to max out our speed. We're then fully equipped to baton pass into our savior. That's right, I fully intend on disrespecting Sanda to the max by sweeping her team with a Komala. I begin by going for fling, thinking that flinging a poison jab into this thing would be a poison move, but uh, that's not actually the case. So I have to finish off our punching bag the next turn with a body slam. Sada then sends in her brute bonnet second, and I don't know if you knew this, 
place, but Kamala actually gets access to Ice Spinner, which means we can easily destroy it in one super effective hit. Fourth out is Fluttermane, and because it only has attacking moves, we can guarantee to connect with Sucker Punch, taking it out in one shot. Fifth, we then face Sandy Shocks, an electric and ground type, which makes it a victim of another Ice Spinner. Which, if you've been keeping count, leaves Sada with only one final Pokemon, her ace, Roaring Moon. And while we could simply outspeed it and take it out with a single super effective Ice Spinner, that kind of mercy is not disrespectful enough. Instead, the type of everlasting humiliation that I have in mind requires a sacrifice. Once I'd secured a safe switch in for my Focus Sash Dreadnaw, nothing could save Sada from humiliating defeat. And so, a month-long journey of streams had come to an end, and I'd defeated a Pokémon Scarlet Hardcore Egglock. And what a journey it was! I'm already planning on doing another one this summer, so make sure to tell me if you want to see that in the comments below, and follow me on Twitch if you want to catch it live, and make sure you get the bell notification on to get notified whenever I start stream, or whenever I post new videos. But until next time... <laughs>